Okay. Oh, got it. <laughs> uh, it's been a while. Um, hello, and um, nice to see some familiar faces. Um, if you don't know my face, I'm Diane Hockridge, and um, I'm really pleased to be here to be able to participate in this series on Ecclesiastes. I've been listening to all the other sermons over the last few weeks, and um, I don't know what you're thinking, but I think it's been great to have um, different people giving their uh, perspectives and thoughts on the different part of Ecclesiastes. It was great also to hear from Mon and hear her news as well. Um, so, um, everything is missed. You know, we've been working through Ecclesiastes and, um, and we often keep seeing those same phrases coming up again. Everything is meaningless, everything is missed, life is puzzling, confusing. Um, and I'm sure we've all experienced um, our own versions of that in our own experiences. Uh, when I was younger, I went on a, a short-term mission to Bangladesh and um, while I was there, the, the team and I, we met up with this young man, young Bengali man called Mihia, um, and he was being trained up to be a university student uh, worker. And um, when I came back to Australia, I stayed in touch with him and continued praying for him and um, also supported him financially while he went to London to get some theological training so that he could uh, go into the, the ministry role. Uh, during that time, he uh, married and uh, had a small child, and then he went back to Bangladesh and started doing the university student ministry. And he'd only been there maybe a year or so uh, when he was killed in a, a bus accident in, f in front of all the university students. And it was such, such a, a tragic end, and I remember at the time, and even now, thinking, you know, what's going on here, God? You know, he's just kind of uh, been equipped, he's just, he's got so much potential, there were so many good things he was doing, and yet, you know, his life was cut short, his life was, his wife was left a widow, um, his child an orphan, just doesn't make sense, does it? And so, you know, I'm sure like me, you've got lots of examples of stories like that as well. I had trouble with this, um, oh, got it the right way around, had trouble working out which way around to press this, this morning. Um, so... Life can often be puzzling and frustrating and painful and unfair, and that's what we're looking at in Ecclesiastes, isn't it? And yet at the same time, we know that life is often good. Uh, there's so many great things in life. And this is the unresolvable kind of tension that the narrator, uh, the teacher in this book of Ecclesiastes is exploring. He's asking some of those hard questions. Uh, how do we make sense of a world in which beauty sits alongside ugliness and pain? Why does one person live a healthy, happy life and another person suffer chronic illness and poverty? Is what ends up happening to us in life related to what we do or what we believe? Or is it just all random and meaningless? So the teacher, uh, sometimes he's referred to as kohelet, a Hebrew word meaning preacher or teacher or leader of the assembly. He's inviting us to come on this journey with him as he asks these questions and explores the meaning of life. And he's really pushing the boundaries a bit. He's really going to the edges of faith. And I think a couple of people have said to me today, it's one of the things they've enjoyed about looking at Ecclesiastes is just the opportunity to reflect on some of those questions that sometimes we might not want to ask. Um, Chris Wright has a good commentary on Ecclesiastes and he says this, he says, Ecclesiastes pushes to its uncomfortable limit a tension between a vision of the world as it ought to be, with righteousness prospering and wickedness confounded, and observation of the world as it is, with its injustice and absurdities. And these are the kind of questions that we all have sometimes, aren't they? What is life about and how do we make sense of it? So let's continue on the, the journey and go with uh, Kohelet, the, the teacher, here he is. I thought maybe he might look a bit like that. Um, and as we've seen in previous chapters, he's been um, kind of exploring all sorts of solutions. He's tried all sorts of things. He's tried wisdom, he's tried riches, he's tried working for satisfaction. But everything he's tried has just left him still groping in the dark and um, grasping in the mist and not being able to make sense of things. And he keeps circling back around and around these same questions. And by the time we get to chapter 8, 
uh, we're beginning to notice some of those familiar things. Obviously, everything is meaningless, everything is missed or puzzling or frustrating. Um, he also talks a lot about under the sun, life under the sun and what that's like. Um, and he often says something um, like what he says in this chapter in verse 15. Uh, he says, So I commend the enjoyment of life because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life that God has given them under the sun. He says that kind of thing several times throughout the book. Um, and I think that's at least part of his answer to the questions he's asking. Uh, but we'll get to that a bit later. So I think in this uh, chapter, there's sort of two main things that we're going to look at. Verses 2 to 8 kind of deals with this area of how do you work under authority. And then uh, verses 9 to 15 is really exploring more that sort of difficulty of understanding the unfairness of life. So when Ecclesiastes was written, uh, Israel had kings who ruled the nation. And indeed, a lot of people think that King Solomon might have been the author of this book. Um, earlier in chapters 1 and 2, the author has been talking about what it was like being king over Israel and all the great projects he did and all the, the wealth he amassed and everything like that. Um, but now in this uh, passage, we're sort of looking at kingship from the other side. What if you have to work for the king? Um, how, how should you then respond? So in Australia, we do actually have a king. Um, I don't think anyone here works directly for him. Um, but we do all have to submit to authority of some sort in our lives, whether that be in our workplaces or at school or perhaps the laws of the local and state and federal governments that we come under. So does this passage have anything to say to us about how to... Um, how to work under authority. Well, I think it's quite interesting if you have a look sort of at verses sort of two to five, um, I would have expected him to say something like what we see in the New Testament, that we should submit to authority out of reverence for God. So 1 Peter 2 reminds us that we should be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good, for this is the will of God. Um, but when you actually look at what he says, he does say, yes, yeah, submit to the king's authority, but it's a sort of fairly down-to-earth, pragmatic kind of way of submitting. Um, in verse 3, he says, don't be in a hurry to leave the king's presence and don't stand up for a bad cause, for the king will do whatever he pleases. Don't rush out of the king's presence, he's saying. Maintain your composure. Why? I, I suppose perhaps, you know, so you don't attract too much attention or look guilty or something. Um, keep your head down. Sometimes it's better to keep your head down. Um, and think twice before standing up for a bad cause because the king's going to do what he wants to do anyway and you don't want to get on the wrong side of the king. So it's pretty pragmatic advice, isn't it, really? Uh, not particularly high principled. But actually... If we think about uh, wisdom literature, and Ecclesiastes is part of the wisdom literature, like Job and Proverbs and so on, that's really what wisdom literature is like. It's dealing with those practical, down-to-earth, everyday matters. How do, we, how do we live in all the circumstances we find ourselves? Um, so it's different to the, the law, parts of the Bible. So the law tells us, you know, um, do not murder, honour your mother and father, all those kinds of things that we should do. Uh, wisdom literature is um, more observational. So you sort of get these reflections on, you know, in these circumstances, you know, you can do this, and in these circumstances, you can do that. Um, it's not hard and fast rules. And you might have noticed that often we even get conflicting proverbs and things. A good example of a conflicting proverb um, is Proverbs 26, 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be just like him. And then verse 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. And we see the same kind of thing, don't we, with our own modern-day proverbs. We often say things like, um, Look before you leap. But then we also say, He who hesitates is lost. Um, and so the sort of wisdom of it is that uh, these sayings apply to some circumstances and not to other not to others, and uh, the wisdom is in working out when to apply them. 
So Ecclesiastes is still inspired by God. It's still God's word to us. But like all wisdom literature, it's the truth, but not the whole truth that's necessarily applicable in every circumstance. Uh, not necessarily black and white rules. Rather, God's truth for us in a complex world. So can we learn anything here about being under authority? Uh, notice in verse 5, he talks about the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. There's a proper time and procedure for every matter. It kind of reminds me of uh, chapter 3, where we have the, the big long list of the times for the different things, the different seasons of life. And in 3.7, he says, there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. Um, and so perhaps wisdom um, about serving under authority is a balancing of understanding the proper procedures and how to act and how to best act in the circumstances um, when we should speak and when we should hold back, when we should stand up for things and perhaps when we should keep a low profile. And interestingly, um, I was trying to think, is there examples in the Bible of people doing both those things? And um, yes, there is. Um, Esther uh, sprung to mind for me. Um, you remember the story of Esther? Um, she ended up married to a ruthless, powerful king. Um, she was very powerless, but with the help of her uncle, Mordecai, she managed to sort of cleverly work around um, the very limited options that she had um, to persuade the king not to kill the Jews. And so God used her, um, her sort of like cleverness in that circumstance of, of working around under authority to bring about good. On the other hand, you have someone like Daniel uh, who often chose uh, to put his head up above the parapet and uh, to not be quiet. Uh, you remember the story of the king saying, everyone needs to pray to me. And so Daniel, Daniel could have just prayed to God quietly in his own heart or even, you know, in the back of his house somewhere where no one saw it. But he opened the windows and prayed in front of everybody, uh, not keeping his head down at all. Um, but he felt that that was the right thing for him to do in that circumstance. So I suppose let's think about how we can be sort of wise and discerning and smart uh, in the way we work under authority. Let's not be the annoying person who never knows when to keep quiet or the equally annoying person who always just sort of says yes to the boss. Um, but let's pray for wisdom that we know when is the right time to take a stand. So. Moving on, thinking about the, the second passage about the unfairness of life. Um, what does he say here? He's sort of really, the rest of the chapter really is about this topic of injustice and unfairness that the teacher observes in life. Um, and he's mentioned this previously and he'll mention it again as well. In verses 9 and 10, he um, acknowledges that sometimes actually the wicked do get what we think they should deserve. Um, sometimes a man lords it over others to his own hurt. And even though um, wicked people might live long lives, they do still ultimately die and lose everything they've worked for. But then later on in verse 14, he's sort of lamenting again that even though sometimes the wicked get what they deserve, actually often they don't. And even worse, sometimes the wicked get what the righteous deserve and sometimes the righteous get what the wicked deserve. Um, and we see that, don't we? Um, if we just look around our world, look at our news feeds, we so often um, see terrible things happening, um, you know, um, murders of innocent women and children or um, people um, being unjustly convicted of something or laws being applied in ways that really, that really hurt people. Um, and so, yeah, in those circumstances, we feel, as, as the, the teacher does here, oh, look, you know, how do we make sense of this? It doesn't really seem to make sense at all. One of the things, as he's, as he's working this through, that he does say, um, is that he, um, he kind of looks at it from the perspective of faith. So if you have a look in verse 12 and 13, he talks about how um, he... Um, I've just lost my place here for a moment. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, that even though the wicked don't always get what they deserve, um, he still knows that it will go better with those who fear God. 
And that's really sort of pointing towards the ultimate conclusion that we get at the end of Ecclesiastes. A uh, bit of a spoiler alert there. Um, so, but yeah, towards the end, we sort of have a bit of a summary which kind of reminds us that there will be a time when people are called to account, even if we can't see it now. And so being wise for us is to, to keep fearing God and trusting that that time will come, even though we're not seeing the outcome of it right now. Um, and so he sort of has that kind of thing that he's working towards. Um, but actually, I don't think he seems like he's very convinced here in, in chapter 8, uh, because he kind of just keeps talking again about this issue of the wicked uh, not getting what they deserve. The other thing he kind of then moves on to as he's thinking about how do we make sense of all of this is that um, saying that I read out earlier about um, eating and drinking. Verse 15, so I commend the enjoyment of life because there's nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad and then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of the life God has given them under the sun. Uh, he said this many times and he will say it again. But what does he mean? Is this a good response to the unfairness of life. I must admit I struggled with this a bit, like what is he actually getting at here? Um, I think one interpretation could be that he's just going, look, it's all too hard. Um, nothing makes any sense. We're all gonna die anyway. So look, you might as well just eat, drink and be merry. Um, and that's a common view of life, isn't it? You may know people who take that view. There's, there's no purpose, so we might as well just enjoy it while we can. Um, and it does sound a bit like that, but I think there's a, a difference um, between what he's saying and just pure pursuit of pleasure. I don't think he's saying uh, just, you know, there's no point in anything, so just eat, drink, and be merry, and pursue pleasure. Uh, why don't I think that? Because well, uh, there's a couple of things in the passage, if you look at it closely, uh, that give us hints that there's a bit more to it. Um, so first of all, he says, our lives are given by God. They're gifts of God. So the wisdom in what he's saying here is that uh, we should recognise that this is God's world and everything in it is a gift from God and enjoy those things as gifts from God. Um, Jesus was a good example of this, wasn't it? Wasn't he? He, um, he actually, while he was here, uh, spent time eating and drinking with friends, conversing, having a good time, turned water into wine, so much so that he got accused of being a glutton and a drunkard, which he wasn't, um, but he was able to enjoy the good things of life. Um, and I think sometimes as Christians, we might have a little bit of trouble with that. Uh, we don't have to be mean and miserable as Christians. We can enjoy those good things that God has given us. And extending from that, I think also, he's reminding us too that to be content with what we have, whatever it is we have, God has given it to us as a good gift. Our tendency is to be dissatisfied and always compare ourselves with others and think we could have more. Um, and then, you know, that just goes around in a vicious circle. So he's encouraging us to be content and enjoy the gifts that God has given us with thanks, whatever they are. So I wonder um, what might be some good gifts of God that you can enjoy and perhaps share with others in this coming week. Another reason why I don't think he's really talking about hedonism per se here or pursuit of pleasure is because he's also talking about toil. Notice that he's talking about uh, toil being accompanied by joy. So it's not just all parties and, and downtime. He's talking about finding satisfaction in our work. And um, the, the, the sort of attitude that we take into our work is important, isn't it? Back in chapter three, he, he says that this ability to find satisfaction in our work is actually a gift from God in itself. What is our work? Well, it's not only paid work. Um, it's whatever God has given us to do at the moment. Um, and God gives us uh, different things to do at different uh, points in our lives. It might be paid work. It might be study. It might be the conversations we have with our neighbours. It might be our work in the community. It could be anything, really. Um, uh, David's um, mum last year moved into a... a an aged care facility, she's very frail now and can't care for herself anymore. And she was telling us um, that she's now got opportunities um, to share the gospel and read the Bible with her care workers who come from countries that have never really been exposed to Christianity. And she wouldn't have had those opportunities before. 
And so that's the, the work that she's got that she can be doing now. And so I think this is, there's really something in this um, reminding us to recognise all our work as well as God's gift to us, whatever it is, and, uh, and to find satisfaction in it and to thank God for it. So this uh, mantra here that he keeps repeating, um, yeah, it's not about pursuing pleasure as a distraction or pleasure for its own end. It's actually, when we think about it, a, a faithful response. He's recognising that he can't comprehend what goes on under the sun. Um, and that, but he's, in the midst of that, he's affirming that God is good. Um, and he's expressing his faith that ultimately God's going to do what is right. He's got this basic biblical framework. He's recognising that God made things good, but that humans messed it up. Um, and in the midst of all this sort of frustration and questioning and the confusion and the mist, he's still hanging on to this framework which orients him in the world and which gives God honour as good creator and trust in his goodness and justice. And, you know, as believers, we, we all have a, a framework, a biblical framework that we're holding on to. But our advantage here in the 21st century is that we've got more of the biblical framework uh, than the teacher had back in Ecclesiastes. We're further on in the biblical story. And I think Matt mentioned this last week as well. Unlike the teacher, um, we've seen God's ultimate answer to injustice in the world, haven't we? And he stepped into history himself to do something about it. Because when you think about it, what's the ultimate example of a righteous person um, getting what the wicked deserve? It was Jesus um, in his death for us on the cross. Um, he, you know, was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He was a victim of, of plots um, and ended up dying a horrible, undeserved death. No one deserves crucifixion. It was a horrible torture that the Romans invented, but Jesus definitely didn't deserve it. Um, he'd done nothing wrong. Um, as the Bible says, he was like a lamb led to the slaughter and became sin for our sake. But that is God's answer to the pain and frustration and injustice of life, his ultimate answer. Um, Jesus' death and resurrection ultimately dealt with the power of death. So the death that uh, the teacher is struggling with in Ecclesiastes is seeming to bring, uh, you know, meaninglessness to life, we know has been overcome. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus has dealt with the death. His resurrection shows us that there's hope for new life. And we're invited to come to him, receive his forgiveness and, and to live that new life now and into the future. And interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 15, I really like this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul goes on to say um, some further words of wisdom for how we should now live, which build on the words of wisdom in Ecclesiastes. He says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. So ultimately, though life is often frustrating, puzzling and painful, I think Ecclesiastes is reminding us that we can trust that God is good. Uh, he's given us good gifts to enjoy and good work to do. So let's give ourselves to that work. Enjoy what God's given us and... Um, and really recognise that our labour in the Lord is not in vain. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that Ecclesiastes is in the Bible um, and encourages us to ask the hard questions. Uh, we thank you that we can trust you. We thank you that you have actually stepped into our world uh, to bring about the ultimate solution uh, to the confusion and the pain and the injustice that we face. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his sacrifice. Um, thank you that it gives us hope and uh, purpose in life. Amen.